Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session 1.3 here in virtual room two, where we're going to be discussing protecting biodiversity for a healthy and sustainable food system. This session is organized in partnership with the European Commission's Directorate General for Health and Food Safety, DG Sante, and of course, the Directorate General for Environment. Thank you for tuning in from wherever you are to follow this virtual EU Green Week conference, heralding a new beginning for people and for nature. And boy, do we need it. My name is Aminda Lee. I'm a British Italian journalist and moderator specializing in environmental topics. And I'm logged in from Rome, where it's very sunny today. I'm honored to be your moderator for this session at Green Week, an event I've been attending for more than a decade, though this year, thanks to COVID-19 pandemic, I must admit it's rather a different experience for us all. In a moment, I'm going to explain how this session will run, but first I have a few housekeeping points for you. As this slide shows, you can send in questions to the speakers by pressing the big question mark button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And you can also chat with other people joining who are watching the same session by clicking on the join chat option, which is on the left hand side at the bottom of the screen, displaying the session's video and slides. And of course, we can revert to what is now old technology and share your thoughts via Twitter using the hashtag EU Green Week. But I do hope that most of the time you're going to be carefully listening to the high powered speakers that we have online this morning. I'd like to um, for them to just say hello for a moment. So when I say your name, please uh, switch on your microphone and say hello. Joining us today, we have Marta Messer, who is director of the European Office and member of the International Council of the NGO Slow Food. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be here with you today. Thank you. We also have Christian Wieger, who is a scientific director of agriculture at the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, or INRE. Good morning, everybody. A pleasure to be with you from Paris, where it's so sunny too. Oh, good. Uh, and last but not least, we have Gus van Laroven, who is a programme leader in biodiversity and environment at the dairy company Friesland Campina. Yeah, good morning to you all. Um, from a, a very rainy the ne uh, Netherlands, so <laughs> different here. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. And we, of course, will be hearing more about uh, more from our speakers in a moment. This virtual platform also has a poll feature, and I'd like to try that out now uh, because we have a few coming up in this session. Please can we launch poll one and you should miraculously see popping up on your screens um, a question and the options that you can choose to vote on. And the question is, what are the greatest opportunities that the food system offers to enhance biodiversity. You've got the following options to choose from. Increasing diversity of plant species and varieties in farmers' fields. Rising the number of livestock breeds at risk of extinction. A sustainable management of fish stocks, reducing discards and bycatches, and all of the above. You can see there's a line running across the screen. This shows you how long you have to vote. Uh, there is some time left. And uh, then we will be um, starting our discussions on the vital role that biodiversity plays in achieving a sustainable food system that protects our planet whilst ensuring food security, food safety, nutritious diets with different foods. After all, we all know food systems are key drivers of climate change and environmental degradation and have a profound impact on biodiversity. Uh, now the voting uh, should almost be closed. Uh, and in a moment, uh, we're going to uh, show uh, the answers on the screen. Um, please, can we uh, pop those answers up on the screen for everybody uh, so that they can see them? Uh, we've had quite a few votes coming in. Thank you for doing that. Um, I can see the results here at the moment. Uh, we need to display them on your screens. Uh, but we have 60% of people saying all these options. That's not a surprise. That was an easy one, really. Um, but then we have, interesting, we have 30% uh, of people saying uh, that it is actually increasing the diversity of plant species and varieties in farmers' fields. Uh, so, 
Um, we will be discussing um, some of this as we go through our session today. Um, and I'm going to explain how it's now going to run. Thank you for voting. We can now uh, put the screen, we can take the results off the screen. After hearing a short opening introduction from each of our speakers, we're then going to discuss three topics, each with its own question time. The first will look at the role of farmers. The second will focus on the role of food producers, understood as manufacturers and retailers. And the final topic will explore the role of consumers, for example, in driving demand. As I've said, there will be a question time for each of the three topics, so please do send in your questions when they occur to you. Don't wait until the very end because we'll have moved on. Before we first start the first topic, I'd like the speakers to briefly introduce themselves a bit more and telling you uh, their perspectives by answering the following question. What is your experience of the connection between biodiversity and a sustainable food system? So let's start off with Marta Messer. Given your role in the flu slow food movement, how would you respond to that question? Thank you, Minda. And again, hi, everyone. Uh, well, the experience of the global movement slow food that has been active really for 30 years, defending everyone's right everywhere to food that is good for them, good for the, for the farmers and producers who grow it and good for the planet, is a very positive experience in terms of the importance of biodiversity for the food system. And here I would like also to clarify what we mean by biodiversity, because often in the Brussels debates, um, we look at biodiversity um, as the nature that surrounds the fields. Um, but for slow food, it's important to zoom in in the biodiversity that we cultivate and farm and fish. So I was happy to see also the fish question in the poll you just showed. Um, because it, this is the kind of biodiversity that is, that is often overlooked, luckily not anymore by the current biodiversity strategy presented by the EU Commission. Um, and it's a very important kind of biodiversity where we've seen a, 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 a very important decline in uh, um, plant species being farmed, in animal breeds, livestock breeds being farmed in livestock, um, in uh, also in fish stocks. So um, this is a biodiversity that is fundamental for sustainable food systems. Uh, we're talking here, we're looking here really ab about local, sustainable, resilient food systems where you have the connections between people. So um, in terms of, so of the question you just presented, in terms of the greatest opportunities, what I would like to add to those four options is one of the greatest opportunities is really the connection between human beings. And we've seen that, I would say, especially in light of COVID-19 of the pandemic, how especially civil society, but not only, has come together in communities, trying to support both farmers, producers, and making sure that people, especially disadvantaged ones, would have access to food. So again, biodiversity is key. It's the biodiversity also of knowledge and know-how that is part of our cultures and that needs to be safeguarded. And also there, the experience of our network and especially of our Terra Madre indigenous network shows that there is a lot to safeguard there that can really empower food sovereignty at the local level. Thank you. Very interesting what you say about biodiversity of knowledge and know-how. That's something that maybe uh, uh, maybe people haven't thought of before. Um, and what about you, Christian? We, uh, as a scientist, uh, what's your experience of the connection between biodiversity and the sustainable food system? Thank you, Aminda. I'm um, I'm scientific director for INRAE, that is uh, quite a, a large uh, European research institute, and uh, I'm covering plant production, animal production, and, and social and human sciences. And um, for, for me, uh, biodiversity and, and sustainable food system are related, uh, are, yeah, are important for three reasons. The first is that uh, biodiversity is per se uh, one part of the, uh, of the sustainability. Um, and if you analyze the ecosystem services that are provided by uh, Agriculture and agri-food system, biodiversity preservation is part of it. But as there is one thing that is very important regarding biodiversity is that it is something we have to look uh, regarding the time scale. Um, we tend to look everything being synchronous, but uh, biodiversity is something that is clearly making the link between all generation and the next generations. Uh, in terms of uh, equity uh, among generations, biodiversity is part is one component. Uh, just at the same, uh, just as uh, climate change is, is one of those components, and we tend to forget that we have 
responsibility for the coming generations. The second item is, uh, as it has just been said by, by Marta, uh, uh, diversity is, uh, is something that is very important because it provides sustainable diets. Uh, having an access to uh, uh, a diverse uh, food diet is, is one, one component, one essential component uh, that is securing uh, health uh, for, for human and especially uh, reducing the level of obesity. And this includes the diversity of species that we have access to, uh, both for animal and, and plants, including fish, and also the genetic diversity within uh, within the species. And the third element uh, is the fact that biodiversity is also has to, to be uh, regarded at the level of the landscapes. And landscape is part of all culture. This is also related to, to the knowledge issue. Uh, we are not simply uh, living bodies that we, where we need food. We, are, we have a culture and, and uh, biodiversity, biodiversity is part of that. And it's, uh, there are plenty of examples where you relate uh, diversity, uh, biodiversity and component of culture. So for these three reasons, uh, biodiversity and, and sustainable food system are completely linked. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting what you say about diets, and I think we'll be talking a little bit about that uh, uh, as time goes on in the session. And uh, last, uh, Gus van Larhoven, what would you say um, to the same question from your perspective as a dairy farmer? Well, I think as a dairy company, we're right in the middle of, uh, I think, uh, a sustainable food system and also um, uh, landscape management. Uh, our member, where we have, we are a dairy company or a dairy corporation, uh, a cooperative owned by 70,000 uh, member farmers. Uh, and together, I combined, I own about a quarter of the Dutch landscape. Uh, so um, they're really part of uh, setting the pace uh, in bi biodiversity restoration, but also the biodiversity quality, of course. And I think the, the diversity uh, set before by uh, Christian and Marta uh, between those, uh, the difference between those farmers are uh, a value on its own. Uh, they have, uh, they all have a different uh, impact on their, uh, uh, on the surroundings, on the ecosystems, and they are an integral part of it. And for us as a dairy company, we uh, decided to to have uh, biodiversity as one of the main topics from our, for our um, sustainability approach. And um, I'm the, I'm the one that's responsible for uh, for our sustainability or our biodiversity strategy within the sustainability approach of Fisco Campina. And as a part of that, we have developed um, a biodiversity monitor. Uh, together with WWF and the Rabobank, uh, and we did that to monitor actually the the, the impact, the total impact from uh, individual farms yearly on their uh, surroundings, so uh, on their ecosystem that are which they are part of. Um, and with the monitor, we can um, annually uh, chart if uh, what their impact is that, and it's a balance between the negative impact of the farm management also, but also the positive impact. Um, and that way we can assess uh, for each of the 17,000 farms uh, what, how much they contribute to a balanced ecosystem or um, biodiversity improvement. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. I'd uh, we certainly want to hear more about this biodiversity monitoring program uh, because I know that one of the problems is uh, actually how you can monitor uh, biodiversity and how you can evaluate that. So uh, I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell us a little bit more about that uh, as we go through the the, the topics. Um, and now I'd like to move on to our first topic, um, which of course you um, you're going to be very involved in, is uh, the role of farmers. Um, feel free, everyone watching, to send in your questions on this topic as we're discussing it. Um, and we're going to start with another poll, please. So can we launch the poll? As before, the question should pop up onto your screen. And the question is, what is stopping farmers using different plant species? And you have the following choices. Low yields, difficult to find, hard to manage, or too costly. And of course, while this refers to plants, it's equally uh, applicable to animal breeds and so on. You still have some time to reply. You can see the uh, line going across the screen. Keep those responses coming in, please. Um, 
And it's interesting what we've been hearing about the need to have a clarified definition of biodiversity. Perhaps maybe we should have had a, a question on that one. Uh, but let's do the one at hand. Uh, and you've still got a little bit more time to vote. And while you're voting, I just wanted to repeat a quote from Matthias Vichera, the General Secretary of Danone, uh, taken from yesterday's opening session. He said, because agriculture plays a positive role in restoring cultivated biodiversity and in fighting climate change, it offers us plenty of opportunities to embrace green and inclusive recovery plans for Europe. That's something perhaps we can touch on in discussion. So now you can see the results of the poll. Thank you for voting. Um, let's see them. Uh, so we have the winning. The winner is that it, these yield the different plant species are hard to manage, uh, followed by low yields. Well, I think low yields is something we will certainly be uh, discussing in uh, this section. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off the discussions by getting the reaction of our speakers uh, to uh, to that poll. Uh, Marta, let's start with you. I was still closing the poll. Um, yeah, this I find it's a very relevant and very interesting question. Uh, let me first make a point. Slow Food has been working for many years with farmers that do farm biodiversity and fish biodiversity. And um, the, the question is more, the point I'm trying to make is it's, it is absolutely possible to farm biodiversity. It is feasible. It's economically viable. It's, of course, a lot of hard work. That's um, that's for sure. But what is stopping farmers from using different plant species or, for that matter, livestock breeds, as you were saying? Um, there are a few things that I would like to mention. First, I'm looking at Europe now, uh, but we can have this discussion more broadly. And it's also reported in different documents by the FAO, among others. But you have in place still a lot of weak or worse negative incentives for farmers and we've seen that specifically in Europe with the common agricultural policy uh, pushing for genetically uniform and high yielding varieties and we do know and by the way discussions are happening right now at the European Parliament and just happened last night at the level of the Council um, but we do know that at the moment the, the cap is rewarded to is designed to reward the amount of land that is owned um, and so it's a system that is totally biased. And we know also from, for instance, a report that came out just this year by the New York Times, what impact that has had. And for instance, in Hungary, there was indeed this report about the, the, the land that was owned for simply um, receiving the cap payments and not for producing really food for the local economy or for people really. So first of all, there are negative incentives in place and we've been very vocal with partner organizations about removing those and making much more binding requirements in terms of uh, biodiversity. And indeed, again, there is the opportunity today and this week at the European Parliament to go much further into these and also in the trilogues that will happen at a later stage between Parliament, Commission and, and Council. Um, the other thing is that, of course, what's stopping farmers well, the kind of con uh, contracts and relationships that there are with retailers at the moment in Europe, five retailers account for 50% of the market in Europe. That means a high concentration of power. They can set the terms. They can basically also push the kind of production and products that they want to see in their sh on their shelves. So um, there are these mechanisms. Luckily, the, there is a proposal by the Commission on unfair trading practices that should improve the situation. But as things that now this concentration of market power is pushing again in the direction of genetically uh, uniform and high yielding varieties and last but not least of course consumers uh, we do all play a part every time we buy food we vote with our fork for the farm for the kind of food system we want and if we all expect to eat strawberries all year long avocados eat salmon and uh, chicken breast only and um, eat only golden apples and conference pears well something's got to give. So of course, we're going to see a decline in biodiversity. So of course, we all have a role to play. And last point I would like to say to mention is the global dimension of biodiversity. Um, the, the issue of access to resources, land, seeds, water is key in maintaining biodiversity also of the local communities elsewhere in the world. And then luckily, we see from Europe episodes of food dumping um, that are compromising local producers and local markets. I'll stop here. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you, Martha. Um, uh, Christian, um, what do you think? The, the question was about what is stopping farmers using different plant species. Uh, perhaps you, from a scientist's point of view, maybe you have something to say about, for example, low yields. 
In fact, the, the question was very good and the answers are very difficult uh, because there are many, many things that are mixed together. Uh, if I start with the, the point raised by Marta, it's, it's clear that uh, CAP gave incentive to have more standardized production, but we must not forget why. Uh, it has been uh, after the Second World War, uh, where most of the of the uh, sign of the uh, the policy have been built. Um, there was a, a, a clear mission to uh, uh, ensure food security for Europe, and uh, and that's why uh, the the CAP has been uh, designed as it was, uh, and and that's why farmers look for economy of scale, and this means to this leads to. Uh, shorter rotation with less species and and uh, more homogeneous landscapes, and this is uh, one of the key uh, uh, determining factor of the of the loss of biodiversity. But why looking for for economy of scale? Uh, it was to ensure cheap food, uh, to ensure safe food, and, and uh, no mycotoxin, for instance. Uh, all these aspects that were. Uh, very negative at that time and also looking for a homogenous product because this was a key aspect to have a, a good industry and and uh, a good uh, food industry and do not forget that we must not forget that europe is clearly a, a leader worldwide and if you have a uh, big companies like frisland campina it's because uh, agriculture have been able to to ensure uh, uh, the provision of of you know food and so we must we must understand all these aspects and uh, looking then for a genetically uniform variety is only uh, is, is a very uh, not a secondary item, but it, it it comes second in the story. So, in fact, the first mission of of, uh, of a policy is to ensure security, and then uh, we must identify what is uh, very important, and it's probably why now uh, biodiversity is and it is very important is a common good, and we must work on that. So. To, to come to the, uh, sorry for this uh, a bit too long introduction, but I think it's very important to put things in perspective. <clears throat> when when we have to increase diversity of species, of course, if we, if we start from a situation where we have low diversity, every time you introduce a new species, species that is not optimum in your condition, and it can, can be low yield, it can be more, uh, it can require investment, new machineries. So it's difficult to t start from a situation where you have very few species to a situation where you have more. But the main the main difficulty is that if you have a farm that has been organized to uh, uh, for looking for economy of scales, um, in fact, the, the, the first item, the first incidence is that you increase the workload, but uh, mainly the mental load of the farmers. And uh, the, the consequence of that is that you, the farmer is perceiving more risk and is avoiding risk. This is normal for every uh, every person uh, and every economic actor. It, it, we must reduce uh, the risk and, and reduce the risk aversion. So these are the main elements why we got to, to very simplified system. And if we want to move out of that, in fact, clearly, CAP and all the national policies have to be very clear incentive for biodiversity at the level of the landscape. I think this is the, clearly the main the main point. If we have very very homogeneous uh, landscape with very few uh, huge fields and very few uh, crop, we will not restore biodiversity. And then comes second the the diversity of of varieties and also. In between, uh, do we still have tomorrow or in the next uh, 20 years, we will still grow uh, pure wheat, for instance, or are we going to grow uh, mixtures? And I think this is something that is very important because it has a huge aspect on the agri-food. And also we must think what is in, in between the crops. When you have, for instance, a crop of, of wheat and, in, and then the next is, uh, is maize, what do you grow in between? So all the intermediate crop, uh, is something that is very, very important because they are able to provide many, many services, including biodiversity. And we tend to forget completely about that. So it, we must have a very holistic approach regarding the change in the cropping system.
Okay, thank you very much indeed. And now I, I think it's time to turn to a, a, someone who's actually a farmer, um, 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 working in the dairy farm. Um, Goose van Laroven, um, what do you think about uh, about the results of that survey? And what's your experience um, in these issues from someone who's actually a farmer? Well, I think it's a very interesting question uh, because as, I think as a farmer, but also as a dairy company, we've been working with our farmers uh, uh, on introducing uh, more herb, herb rich grassland types. So that means that there are a lot more species in the grassland than normally. I think uh, most of our farmers, but also ourselves as a dairy company, see the problem of the monocultures. So we have been experiencing uh, voluntarily with our dairy farmers on uh, on seeding uh, herb rich grass types or, or grasslands and um, it's, I think it's very we, that we have done uh, we have experienced for, for the last two years and I think the, re, the intermediate results are very interesting uh, because we see in our, in our view there are a lot of opportunities here uh, for example the, the the richer or the diversity also uh, serves ecosystem services like carbon sequestration and drought resistance and even uh, as we think uh, the a uh, animal health um, and we are also looking as a dairy company to uh, to, to, to looking um, into the effects of the uh, of the herbs onto the uh, milk composition and I think in the near future there will be opportunities for us to utilize it in our dairy products but back to the question I think there are certainly some challenges for the farmers to introduce uh, uh, richer or diverse species. We see that with our dairy farmers who are actually uh, uh, experiencing right now what, what it means. And um, the, the, I think mostly at, in the, at the beginning, the perception of the dairy farmers, it will lead to, uh, to less yields. But to our experience, that's not the case. I think the yields uh, are maybe a bit lower, but but uh, I think the, the, the intake by the dairy cows is higher because they prefer, uh, when grazing, they prefer to graze in the, in the diverse grasslands uh, over uh, grazing in the uh, more monoculture. So the intake by dairy cows is higher. Uh, so uh, I think that's really good, a good experience to have already. On the other hand, we see uh, from experience from our farmers that um, uh, th that the grasslands, these types of grasslands, uh, need a different grassland management, and that's one. Of, that's a really big issue. Uh, and, and I think, from my own, own experience, I can tell that uh, you are used uh, to manage the, the grassland in a certain way, using fertilizer, manure, and also um, the, the grazing system is. All, I think it's all uh, based on the monotype uh, grasslands. But when using a different um, uh, a different uh, um, seed mix, and then um, you have to rethink it all. So uh, that for me, that's one of the biggest challenges to to overcome as a dairy farmer. Of course, it sounds uh, it sounds very complicated. Uh, but it's very interesting that you say that the cows prefer uh, gr um, grass that has more variety. So uh, they know better than we do. They understand the importance of biodiversity. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we have um, we have a question. Uh, please do send in your questions. We're going to actually be wrapping up this dis this part of the discussion in a minute. But there'll be more opportunities for you to send your question in for the next two topics. But the question that that we have have uh, from Angeline, uh, Angelika Pullen is how would the speakers assess the deals on the EU cap that were struck in both the Council and Parliament last night? Despite the green rhetoric, they seem to do little for biodiversity protection. Um, uh, so I know, Marta, can I, can you already started talking about the cap? Would you like to expand on that a little bit uh, in, a, in a couple of sentences? Absolutely. So we saw yesterday two main things happening. One was about in Parliament um, that was not so positive in terms of uh, pushing for higher ambitions of the CAP and especially for alignment with the Green Deal uh, in the sense that it still uh, is going in the direction of maintaining payments per hectare, which is the mechanism that we've seen in place so far and that has clearly many limits. Um, but votes are still happening today as we're speaking and the rest of the week so there's still opportunity for members of the european parliament to push for uh, stronger uh, 
uh, measures for biodiversity. Um, the, the other thing is that yesterday night, indeed, there was a meeting of the agri-ministers. There, there were some, I would say, more positive um, outcomes in the sense that farmers would receive financial support under the condition that they adopt practices beneficial for the climate and the environment. And um, there are also some, um, indeed, like it seems this would be uh, true for all farmers. So it's uh, it seems a bit more binding. Uh, now, we do hope that there are much stronger binding measures and we will have, we we'll make, of course, pressure on our decision makers and we'll have to see what happens at the level of the trilogue in the weeks to come. Thank you. Christian? The, the, the vote of the parliament uh, and, and uh, in, in the council. In fact, the, the point is uh, uh, beyond the, the, the political issues and, uh, and all these elements, is in fact how uh, the, the policymakers are considering uh, the tension between biodiversity preservation and the production issues. In fact, they tend to, and it, this is very common, to consider that things are fully opposite. So either you preserve biodiversity or you produce. And in that case, in fact, you can you choose your, your side. In fact, the key point for the policy is what is the type of policy, the type of uh, cropping system, the type of society that is able to combine these two aspects? I like very much when, when Gus was explaining the positive and the negative impact. We tend to only consider the negative impact. And in fact, there are plenty of possibilities to combine biodiversity preservation and Actually, we, would, we should say biodiversity restoration and the capability we have to produce and to ensure a, a secure and a good food. And, but this, this requires clearly a very strong shift and so as a consequence, a very strong uh, 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 willingness of the policymakers. And they must realize not only the tension for today, but the responsibility for tomorrow. I think we must clearly have that in mind. You and Goose. Thank you, Mina. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think it's a missed opportunity because, uh, it, it, in my opinion, um, the climate change and biodiversity laws are the main challenges uh, of, our, I think, uh, of this generation. Um, and and I, as I agree with Christian when he says that um, that it's not an op that they're not opposites, like producing food and restoring biodiversity can go together really well. Um, but we have to change the system of the, the, the system of, um, of the, mar well, the, the, mar the market system, but also the system of, uh, of dairy farming. Till now we were producing food, but I think we have to see that our farmers and in general in Europe can produce a lot more than food. They can produce ecosystem services um, they, um, that really, if you combine those, you can really contribute to the restoration of biodiversity and even have an impact on uh, a positive impact on climate change. I think what's really interesting about farmers, they are, they're one of the few groups actually that uh, have a negative impact, of course, but also can contribute to a positive uh, impact on biodiversity worldwide. Um, and they are, I think that it's, that there, is, there is the opportunity to have more positive impact than negative impact. And I, I really can't see any other um, sector, so to speak, that, that has that uh, opportunity. So we should use, uh, should, uh, I think we should invest more in, as a European Union in, in, in that direction. You, Christian, I know you wanted to say something else a moment. Uh, if you go from the, the policy uh, level to the farmer level, in fact, one of the points is that it is very difficult to, for a player, so a farmer, for instance, to measure in real time its real impact, uh, either positive or negative, on biodiversity. And I think that is one of the reasons why people are so scary about uh, considering biodiversity, both at the policy and the national level or European level, and the farmer. We must work to uh, have tools tools for the farmers to be able to measure through proxies and things that are very simple, what is the, their actual impact on biodiversity. And if we manage that, we will able we will be able to consider biodiversity at the same level as Euro, uh, as a, uh, the, 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 the economic aspect, because this economic aspect is able to, is easy to consider simply because you count the Euros that you produce. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now going to move on to the next topic, uh, which is the role of food producers and retailers in the provision of more diverse and higher quality foods. In fact, we've already started to touch on this, talking about the different varieties available in shops. Um, before we start the discussions, uh, I'd like to launch another poll, please. Uh, and this time the question is, how could food producers and retailers promote food with a positive impact on biodiversity? You've got the choices of incentivized biodiversity friendly farming practices, self-regulate with biodiversity codes of conduct, inform consumers on biodiversity impact of foods and all of the above. And while we're waiting for the poll to run, just a reminder, you can send in your questions to the speakers on this particular topic as we're talking. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be getting to them. Don't be shy. Uh, it's very easy to send them in. Just click, click on that big question mark on the bottom right hand side of your screen. And it's also worth remembering that this topic actually covers two important policy areas, um, the biodiversity strategy, uh, strategy, as well as the farm to fork strategy for a, a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system. And now the vote has come to an end and let's show the results on the screen. Um, so uh, everybody liked the, all these options, uh, but the, uh, there was a tie for second place. Uh, we had 90% voting for incentivized biodiversity friendly farming practices. And we had 90% also thinking inform uh, consumers about biodiversity impact of foods. Very interesting. Um, so as before, I'd like to get our speakers to react to, to that and to look and think about the role of the food producers. Um, Christian, let's start with you this time. I need to start, I prefer when Marta is starting. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, um, uh, I, I do not take, consider the, those who are saying uh, everything. Um, in fact, it, it, um, it's interesting to see that there is a tie between uh, informing uh, the end user and uh, giving incentive to the farmers. In fact, in both cases, you have something, one thing that is common and is, that is related with what we discussed just before is how you measure. Because if you have an incentive, you must be able to document the relationship between between the incentive you you give and the the results so you need something to measure and if you want to inform the the end user you must be able to document that uh, this is the, the 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 first element the second element is uh um if you want to give an incentive what must be the the quantity of the the value of this incentive and when you have a a, a consumer uh at the end is the uh uh, what are, what is the willingness to pay for uh, uh, for having more more biodiversity? And this uh, this uh, is clearly one uh, kind of a, a societal uh, societal question: is what is the value we give to biodiversity? Is it is it something very important or not? Uh, I I absolutely fully agree with what Gus said before. Uh, climate change and biodiversity are the key challenge for all generation. Uh, otherwise, uh, the next generation will be really in trouble. So we must be able to give a high value to biodiversity. But clearly at the moment, this is something that is very, very difficult. Uh, what is the value you give to the, the number of insects you have in your garden? It's, uh, you, you, very often you consider them more as a problem than as a, as a resource. And we must clearly change our mind on that. Interesting, uh, the value of insects in your garden. Yes, uh, I'm sure quite a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to get rid of them, and that's not a good idea. Um, and the thing about measuring biodiversity, and this is where I want to come into you, uh, Goose, uh, because you were talking about this monitoring system. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and talk about the, um, the food production angle? Yes, I, I think it's... Uh, the biodiversity monitor is exactly the the, um, the principle that Christian described. Uh, we we try to find proxies for the impact, so both the negative impact and the positive impact for individual farms. Uh, and we we see it as a global challenge. So we were not only looking at the, the local impact, but also impact abroad, so in, in other regions of the world. So we are combining those dimensions in one system, so to speak. And um, 
And uh, for us, that's the starting point of, uh, of how we as a food producer, as a, a dairy company, uh, can promote uh, food production with a, a net positive impact. Uh, our aim is to have a net positive impact as a total dairy corporation, a cooperative in, in, in the near future. Um, and we've been trying all these options that are stated here in, these, uh, in, uh, in this uh, um, survey. I think we, uh, we, we are incentivizing our farmers. Uh, so we have set up, uh, based on the biodiversity monitor, we have set up a remuneration scheme. scheme. It's called Focus Planet. Um, and uh, it's, uh, the remuneration is set up in two different parts. First of all, there is a, a cooperative arrangement that means that the farmers with the best, uh, with the lesser results, are paying the farmers for the with the best results. So, um, and also, as a dairy company, we are trying to, of so to speak, to sell the positive impact of our of our farms and the milk we set up uh, the milk of those farms uh, uh, to our customers, and um, and that means that we have that we have uh, extra income uh, with the biodiversity positive milk, so to speak. And those extra earnings are paid out again to our farmers through the same remuneration scheme. But in general, I have to say uh, um, uh, that's my. I think after a few years, that's my opinion is, is that we uh, that's not enough to change the whole system. The market uh, at the dairy market it can only thrive by um, uh, uh, by 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 its uniqueness. So for us, I think. 10 to 20 percent of our farmers, we can have extra earnings on biodiversity, on um, good biodiversity results. But for the other 80 percent, yeah, we we can't offer them uh, anything. And so we have to find a, a different a different way to get there. And that's why we are working together with other stakeholders to, for so to speak, to stack the the uh, the, the, um, uh, the earnings or the uh, the, the the earning model for our farmers and that way we can uh, set up a, uh, an environment that farmers with good biodiversity results or net positive results um, have extra significant extra earnings and that leads to um, a new business model for all farmers but it's a long long road ahead um, and we need i think we we need more cooperation throughout the, the, the total dairy chain Interesting. Okay, I'm sure we'll actually um, discuss the the whole dairy chain uh, and the whole food chain and getting everybody uh, involved um, in in working together. Um, thank you for that response. I'm going to go to Marta in a minute, but please just a reminder that uh, you can send in your questions. Uh, you just need to click on the little um, question mark um, on the bottom right hand side of your screen and then type it in, and uh, it uh, it appears on our screens here. Uh, so. Um, please do send these questions in because we're coming um we're going to uh, have a little bit of time for this debate and then there's another one in a moment looking at the role of consumers marta um turning to you um what do you think about the results of that poll about asking how could food producers and retailers promote food with a positive impact on biodiversity thank you minda well i have two main points here one is about i would make a distinction be between producers if you want and retailers in our experience, producers can have a symbiotic relationship with farmers. Meaning if you're a cheese producer, then where do you source your milk from? Do you know the farmer who's producing that milk and what cows he has and um, what uh, grass they're grazing and so on? And in our experience, again, when there is this symbiotic strong connection between the artisan food producer and the farmer, that's when biodiversity is at its best. And again, here I'm looking we're really focusing into uh, the biodiversity that is farmed and cultivated and that goes hand in hand with the biodiversity of the whole ecosystem. Um, so that's the first thing. And we have the experience where, for instance, just to mention one example, but we have a pro um, project in Italy, we call it Presidium, um, on the Piedmontese cattle. And there they've really been doing an amazing job in terms of working from the biodiversity in the soil where the grass grows for grazing the cows 
to of course animal welfare standards and how the animals are kept to even how the meat is cut to get the best quality out of the product that has been you know treated and farmed so well up to that point and going on to a project with schools and school canteens to make sure that there were ba balanced diets and so on so this is just to say it's really about this strong connection about retailers they again um, retailers absolutely can play an important role, um, but there I think we need a change of perspective. So what we see, as I was mentioned before, is rather retailers imposing through their market power the standards and the ways on the producers. We have a very good experience that is the reverse with, for instance, Coop in Switzerland, where they are promoting biodiverse products uh, that are promoted by Slow Food. So Slow Food has projects on the ground to support farmers keeping alive cultivated biodiversity. And what has happened there is that, again, there was really a lot of hard work by everyone, because, of course, when you're working with small scale farmers pr producing biodiversity, you have to deal with seasonality, with quantity, um, you know, with ruptures in stock because you work with nature. So you're not uh, like you're producing, but nature plays a role, of course. So you cannot exactly say how much your quantity is going to be. And you don't want either to overproduce just to meet the requirements of the retailer, because then what happens to the extra production, which is, by the way, one of the reasons why we're experiencing so much food waste in our food system. Um, so again, it's absolutely the two can play an absolutely important role. I would just like to add one thing very briefly connected to the indicators that um, uh, the previous speakers were uh, mentioning. And I think, and actually, this is also the recommendations we've been giving to the uh, UN Secretariat on the, on, uh, the conservation of uh, biological diversity in view of the convention that is happening next year. Um, and as indicators, we really need to have the numbers of cultivated species at the moment there are nine percent of the six thousand plant variety species plant species nine percent alone that account for 66 percent of total crop production globally let the number go up that's a strong indicator that biodiversity is doing a lot better we need the as an indicator the number of farmers that cultivate biodiversity one out of every four farmers that has appeared over the last 20 years in europe that's a strong indicator that biodiversity is not going well. Um, you need also like indicators of the number of food artisans that are still out there. Biodiversity is also the biodiversity of microorganisms and bacteria that allow for, for instance, fermentations to start. And again, the biodiversity of knowledge and know-how. So these are all important things. Of course, also, again, just to pick on one element of the survey, information to consumers is key. This is something we've also been working hard on. Um, labeling is absolutely one way to get to the consumers and inform them uh, we have this specific project called the narrative label where it's really about writing black on white you know these are the characteristics of the product so this is the breed that was uh, farmed this is the space the uh, uh, animal had for grazing this is what it grazed on this is where it was slaughtered this is the distance between the farm and the slaughterhouse and it's a project that we've been running uh, at the moment mostly in italy you find many of the rarity labels um in in some of the italian stores um it's a it's a it's a label that we're also picking up in other countries in europe and it does work of course again you know, one criticism is like people do not want to read, well, up to the people's choice, but you at least need to give the option to find out more about their food. Interesting. Uh, and in fact, we've got a question about that uh, from Amina Kaladun. Um, should we think about labeling um, animal welfare, good agricultural practices to enhance the shift towards a food system that protects biodiversity? Um, I think you've probably already answered that talking about your narrative labels. Very interesting. And of course, technology can help there as well with blockchain because people can put in the information. That means it can't be altered. Um, do uh, either of other other speakers want to um, pop in and talk about the labeling, uh, perhaps Christian? So it, it's, uh, it's, it is interesting. The, the, the key point is how, what is the quantity uh, of information a uh, consumer can uh, uh, read um, uh, and, and digest before making his decision or, or her decision. And uh, this is clearly a, a key point. This is why I was pointing out uh, uh, what is the indicator we want to uh, to document? Uh, the people who, have, who are uh, very aware about biodiversity, they will accept to spend time to read uh, 
uh, a nice and narrative label. Uh, for the others, you must have very, very short indica indications that are relevant for that. Uh, and there is a kind of uh, uh, education to be made uh, through uh, the information being given on, on, the, on the food. This is, in fact, uh, very much related with the advertisement. Uh, how we advertise for uh, a food product? Are we advertising for uh, the, the, the food quality or the, uh, the energy aspects, uh, uh, the protein content? Or do we also document the, how it is related with uh, uh, the, the, the nature of diversity? It's very interesting, for instance, to look at the, the package on, on the camemberts uh, or, or the cheese Europe-wide or on the milk and how the, uh, um, the, the, the relationship with biodiversity is, is visible or not. And uh, if you do this, you will see huge differences among countries. Uh, so how the diversity is perceived among countries. Thank you. And I'd like to go to uh, Goose, um, not just to answer that question, but there's also a couple of questions specifically coming for him regarding milk and uh, uh, earnings and things like that. Um, could you give us a, a, a short and sweet reply, please? I try and answer them uh, all, all together, but I, I think labeling is an interesting question. Um, I think, in my opinion, we, 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 should, we, we need a, a global standard for biodiversity impact so that we are all talking about the same, we can benchmark the same, and we can use that, uh, that standard also for labeling. Uh, we've, uh, we, we've, we've been exp um, uh, trying this as Fiscopina as well. We set up a separate milk stream called Planet, On the Way to Planet Proof, which is biodiversity, our biodiversity monitor is a, a big part of, uh, and it's helping. It's, we are working together with retailers to, uh, to, to, to sell our milk that way uh, to uh, um, a different, uh, to, a, to a price premium on our milk for our farmers. But it's only for uh, within our 17,000 farmers, it, I think there's only room for about uh, 600 to 1,000 farmers in that, uh, that labeling um, uh, uh, initiative. We are, for, of course, looking for for other opportunities, and we are investigating uh, the, um, the, the, the 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 composition of milk relating to the high biodiversity farms, for example. And I think is what what's interesting is the uh, the herbage grasslands. We think there is a really there is a real difference there, but we really don't know. There are opportunities, but there are also downsides. So I think it was mentioned by Christian that. Uh, some herbs can also have a negative impact on the milk composition, and there are risks there for um, uh, just for the milk, the milk quality. But in general, I think there are more opportunities. We should investigate. We are investigating them. And uh, the last question is about how much re remuneration is needed. Uh, to, in my in my experience, uh, at least uh, a calculated percent of uh, a, cent, a cent per kilogram of milk, we need at least three cent per kilogram of, per kilogram of milk extra, but that's only covering the cost and is not giving an um, a, an extra incentive to a farm or farmers to change their way of working. Uh, that's really I think that's in general we we would need five cents per extra. Uh, per kilogram of milk extra to have that incentive and even I think when you uh, pay it out per kilogram of milk that has a wrong incentive too because then farmers are motivated extra to produce even more milk which has a negative could have a negative impact on biodiversity so we should rethink that uh, as well a little bit uh, maybe Thank you. <laughs> it's very complicated, isn't it? You, it's like a, a puzzle. You move one thing, and then it affects something else. It's really quite difficult to get this balance. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I want uh, Christian has a point on the analysis of milk, uh, and then we're going to move on to the final topic. Christian, just say that there are plenty of uh, documents and uh, and research and analysis that have uh, related the diversity of the diet. Uh, of a cow and uh, the quality of the milk. And, uh, and as you said, uh, when you increase the diversity of species, you have uh, more, uh, especially a variation on the, uh, the fatty acid that are in, in the milk. This has been uh, very well studied over the last 20 years. And it's something that you can uh, expand beyond the, the milk production. Uh, if you uh, change, for instance, the, the diversity of, uh, or if you go for more diverse uh, crop or mixtures of uh, between wheat and, and protein crop, for instance, you can 
get very, very different diet that are uh, or very different biomass for, for processing. And also one thing we must have in mind, if you increase, for instance, the diversity of, if you grow several varieties of wheat together, you have less impact of disease or less conse possible conse negative consequences on the presence of mycotoxin, for instance. So we must have a, a very comprehensive and a broad uh, approach of all these questions. There is nothing simple and uh, every coin has a second face. Ah, uh, thank you. Yes, nothing is simple, uh, including keeping our timings. I'm going to now move on, I'm afraid, to our third topic, um, which we have a short time to discuss about consumers. And like before, I'd like to run a poll, please. Can we start that? And it should pop up on your screens. What encourages consumers to demand for a more diverse food supply? So what is it that makes us buy more diverse food? Is it low prices? health benefits, helping the environment, moving to a more plant-based diet, or supporting local. And when you're answering this, do think about what encourages you to buy your food, because of course we're all consumers, we all buy our food. Um, are you thinking more of your purse or are you thinking of saving the planet? Um, and uh, so we'll keep the voting going on and we will have uh, questions as before for the participants uh, for the um, for the final uh, uh, discussion on consumers. Uh, so again, you can send those in. Uh, we only have a few minutes left in the session, so everything will have to be nice and short and sweet, uh, including uh, answers to the questions and looking at this poll. So thank you for voting. Uh, we've got quite a few votes in there. And as you can see on your screens, uh, the winning option is health benefits. So 36%. Um, then we had low prices, uh, so that came second, interesting. Uh, and then something local, um, that was that was third with 20%. Um, so what I'd like to do is quickly go back and uh, get our, the reaction of our speakers to that. Let's start with you, Goose. Well, I, I do see that sustainable produced food is becoming more and more important, uh, uh, more, uh, becoming more a, more a part of consumer demand uh, but I think that realizing a transition to a more sustainable agriculture um, can never be achieved through commercial opportunities alone. So there must be cooperation throughout the total dairy chain and throughout, I think, um, the European Union as well. Uh, but I see uh, that I see opportunities for local, but it's not the solution. I see opportunities for health benefits, but it's very diff difficult to prove. So it's not the solution. Um, and I think is what we should look for is to um, to create a bigger movement in uh, uh, overall. It's easily said, but uh, difficult uh, to be uh, to realize. I think. And in fact, um, uh, this, the, the result of our poll uh, links into a question uh, that we've had sent in um, uh, from Anastasia, which is, what do we know about how biodiversity affects the nutritious quality of our food? Um, so while I'm coming to you, Christian, maybe you can also answer that question at the same time. The, the, uh, the nutritious quality is... Uh, um, in fact, the point is that when you eat, you eat a diversity per se. So <clears throat> we have we focused a lot uh, in, in research about the quality of, of uh, each component of a diet. But what is important is the diversity, the complexity of this diet. And uh, the, the, the worst issue is to have a very uh, simple, very simplified diet. And the, the, this is clearly the nutritious aspect. This is why biodiversity is so important. Regarding the poll, I'm very surprised uh, by, by the answers to uh, that is putting the transition of the diet as being the last item. In fact, the, <clears throat> it's clearly the composition of the diet and especially the balance between plant product and animal product that is putting a, lot, a major pressure on, on the on the. Uh, all the agricultural system and the agri-food system. And it's uh, interesting to see that people not, are not considering this uh, as, a, as a key element. And, and okay, we, we, we discover that, and or, we, or we find, or we see that uh, health concern is important. It's interesting to see the local issue uh, being, being important. Um, 
it's uh, for for the uh, all the the, uh, the short distance market, all the locavore uh, approach, uh, uh, yeah, based food or, or situ uh, local local food is something that is important. But the ta the challenge we have for for food security is to have a nice combination between long uh, long chain and short chain. Because, for instance, if Frisland Campina is contributing and, and they are contributing to the food security in Europe, is because they are producing a lot for the long chains. And I, I'm going to have to interrupt you because we've only got one minute left and I want to hear Marta at least talking for a second about consumers. Sorry, Christian. Marta? Very briefly. Uh, thank you, Minda. So in terms of consumers, um, just two data, the Eurobarometer, so a bigger survey than the one we just had now, but they asked uh, consumers across Europe if uh, local products were important. 87% said yes in the food choices. And when ranking the most important factors, the first one that came was actually taste. And then that was followed by safety, and the third only was cost. So I think this is important, interesting results. Um, so what encourages consumers education education at all levels from schools to awareness raising um you name it for grown-ups and kids and we have a lot of experience in that showing impact uh, but also the opportunity to choose again as i was saying at the moment the, the market is controlled by five big retailers and the same concentration of power we see the seed market so if you want concentration of power overall across the food chain is a big issue but when it comes to consumers if you live in a food desert there is just so much you can do to buy biodiverse food so we need policies, urban planning, food policies that encourage also diverse local economies and the diversity of also local shops and market fa farmers markets that allow consumers to find those biodiverse products. I'll stop here because we're out of time. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, with that, on behalf of the session organizers, DG Environment in partnership with DG Sante, I'd like to thank our three excellent speakers for their contributions. It's a shame we didn't have more time to hear them. I hope those of you following found the discussion stimulating and interesting. If you're interested in food topics, you may want to tune in to session 3.4, discussing farming for food and for nature. That will be happening in room three from midday to one to one o'clock today. There's now a 15 minute break before the next set of sessions start at 10.45. Time to stretch your legs and get a tea or coffee before settling down in front of your screen. I'd like to conclude by thanking you, the audience, for your concentration, your involvement in the polls and for sending in questions. And with that, I now close this session.